fantastic and wonderful experience for your children uh, and that's the, the ski trip to Austria 22nd of March this year um, we're going to be getting on that coach and driving down across the country getting on the ferry getting across Europe and arriving at a resort to go and enjoy the, the, the brilliance of what is a ski trip uh, I've been lucky enough to actually go out to resort already this year so I took my family skiing at, at uh, New Year so I went to Alpendorf, the resort that we're going to, I went to Blackout, uh, and I'm pleased to be able to inform you that there's absolutely tons of snow in resort at the moment. That means that, obviously in a few, few weeks time, um, we are very, very confident that there's going to be some great conditions for, for this skiing experience. Um, why do we do this? I mean, as a teacher, you know, you, you look forward to your holidays, very much so, because it is a very, very tiring job working with young people. And so why would you, why would you give up your, your Easter holidays to, to take a group of 72 children to, uh, to a foreign country? Well, for me personally, I, I remember when I was taken on a, on a ski trip from, from my school, um, Mr. Peacock, my PE teacher, uh, getting on that trip. I mean, it's one of those kind of defining moments in the school life. And I remember everything about it. I remember the ski fit, um, I remember the coach journey, I remember being on that ferry, I remember being away from my parents for a week, it was brilliant. And I remember the people I shared the room with. And, and it, it is a lifelong experience. And no disrespect to anybody that teaches maths or English or, or science, you know. I think you children are not going to necessarily remember the, the nitty gritty of all of those subjects, but they will definitely remember a ski trip. Now, I know that there's some faces in here who've been on a, a previous ski trip and are lucky enough to come on a second or third trip, so that's kind of like um, obviously food for thought in that, that their parents and those children are desperately wanting to come again. Um, it is about developing those, those life skills, about being away, being independent from you. You know, the ability to be able to get up in the morning without having that knock on, on the door, um, get themselves dressed and get themselves down for breakfast, you know. Those are all life skills, aren't they? Um, it's so much fun to ski, you know. Um, I was uh, trying to like talk with my daughter and just said, you know, saying to her, that feeling of, of just being at the top of a slope and then, then all of a sudden it just clicks and, and you point and your skis down the slope and it's just so exhilarating. The moment where you feel just a little bit out of control and then the adrenaline sort of kicks in and then you get to the bottom and you realise you've done it and you're like, you want to do it again and again and again and again. And I still get that as, a, as an oldish man. When I go skiing, I get to the top of the piece and I really, really enjoy that kind of sense of getting down something. Obviously, we're going to Austria to so culturally enhance it. Um, we're going to go and experience everything that Austria has to offer in terms of its uh, après ski. Um, we're going to obviously experience the, the, the lifestyle of the people, obviously, in, in Austria too. Um, there's going to be loads of independence skills because, you know, I'm not going to be dad all of the holiday. They're going to have all of that time by themselves with their friends and they're going to have to, to be independent and kind of like get themselves organised um, and resilient. A huge amount of resilience is going to be required. Um, and then the fact that they're going to be uh, away with 71 other children, they're going to have to interact socially with each other. Um, lifelong memories um, certainly improve their self-esteem. Um, that's, that's hopefully what they will achieve. And also, you know, have a wonderful, wonderful time away from all of you as well. Um, and also, we'll give you a nice opportunity to have some time away from your children too, which, uh, which obviously is uh, controversial, but definitely true. <laughs> right, so, first and foremost, um, the staff. 
you know, I have to give a massive shout out to any of the staff and all the staff who were on the trip. So there's many of us in the room, Miss uh, Franklin and Miss Richards and Mr. Sloan and Miss Brave and Miss Gordon and Mr. Potter and Mr. Hunt in the room. Um, these are some of the members of staff on the, tr on the trip. Um, we are getting to um, enjoy the thrills of skiing, but it's it very much far from a relaxing holiday. You know, we are up at, you know, silly o'clock in the morning, helping to, to get the children out and about for skiing, and then we are still awake at, at late at night, still working hard to ensure that everybody's safe and everybody's having a nice time. And it, and it starts from the minute we get on the coach to the minute we get off. So it is far from a relaxing holiday. Um, we are going to be working hard. And we, yeah, the staff need recognition, you know, the fact that they are giving up that time. So from me, I say thank you to all the staff who, who volunteer. Um, we've generally got quite a, a nice cohort of st uh, staff who want to come on the ski trip, which means that we are able to run a two-coach trip. And I was delighted to be able to turn around to all of you who put, put a request in to say, yes, there is a place for everybody. Um, Going from a one coach trip to two coach trip a couple of years back was a little bit daunting, but I think we've got the gist of it now. Um, so the <coughs> two coach trip gives us that opportunity to take everybody there. Um, so these are the staff on the trip. So we've got myself, trip leader, and Miss Franklin, who's deputy leader, Miss Hunt, Miss Gordon, Miss Richards, Miss Bray, Mr. Sloan, Mr. Potter, Miss Abdi, who's not here tonight, and Miss Sutherland, who's also going to be on the school trip. Um, in terms of COVID, so I've been in here and um, talking about the, the rigmarole of trying to get into Europe because of uh, vaccinations, etc. But we've, we've obviously COVID seems like a long, long time ago, so I don't need to talk to you in any detail about the COVID situation. Um, but what I want to talk to you is about how you get prepared for a holiday. Well, it's like any holiday that you go on as a family or as an individual that you've got to have a stress about what to take on on such trip so um it is a stress isn't it so i can only provide you with the details on bag size hand luggage requirements specialist clothing essentials and the activities outside skinny will be enjoying just be mindful that we are predominantly going to be skiing so from, from the start of the day, we're going to be wearing ski attire. And then right up until the very end of the day, we're going to be wearing ski attire. And as a consequence of that, you don't need an extensive wardrobe. You just need the, the ski clothing, really, and the layers to go underneath the ski clothing. Um, you don't need to bring lots and lots of changes of clothes. Um, only lounge clothes for the evening. And most of the time, we're either on an evening activity or just lounging around in the hotel. So things like joggers and t-shirts are absolutely fine. They, they have, you know, really warm hotels. So whilst you might be in a mountain environment, the hotels are always baking hot. And if you're a hot person like me, pack some shorts. And it sounds bonkers to think you're going on a winter holiday, but pack some shorts because the hotel will definitely be hot. Um, and we don't need to worry about being too cold. So I've said one suitcase or hold all to carry the specialist clothes and the leisure clothes. Um, this luggage will not be accessible during the trip. So when we're, when we're driving out there in the coaches, everything that goes in that bag you're not going to have access to until you get to the hotel. And then one piece of hand luggage to carry with them onto the coach for the journey. This is going to have all the things like their entertainment, the food, the drink, any warm layers if they want to take things like blankets, a travel pillow, certainly a wash bag. Definitely important to take a wash bag, um, and it might be worth, you know, as a as a layer, having a ski jacket on the coach because we're driving through the night, and there will be times when we'll be stopping to, to get off the coach to go to the loo. You know, it, it will be, you know, March time. It, it's potentially going to be like freezing conditions, so having that ski coat might be um, an option. It also, something to wear on the coach, and also puffs up quite well as a, a quite a large pillar. Now, in terms of the kit list, um, I've, I've already provided this kit list to you um, a couple of months ago. Um, this has got the specialist clothing in, and I've kind of brought some of the specialist clothing into the, to the meeting and I've put it all out of the front. This is this, the, this clothing from Interski that you might want to have a, have a look at and consider renting. 
But we've got our salopex, which are our ski trousers. They're waterproof and, and fleece lined or, or lined so that they've got waterproof uh, properties and also thermal properties. So if you're falling around in the snow, which is definitely there as a potential, you've got the, you know, the waterproof layers. Ski jacket again, the ski jacket's got like it's got a, a ski skirt, and if you fall on your bottom and you slide down the, the slope on, on your bum, that ski skirt stops the snow going all up your back. So whilst you might have a jacket, ski jackets are better than just a normal waterproof jacket. Um, ski gloves are, are a must or ski mix. Um, warm hat, kind of like well, we wear helmets when we ski. Everybody wears a helmet all of the time. They're provided by the ski company. So do you need a, a warm hat? Well, it's if you take a helmet off, then you've got something to keep your head warm. I put an asterisk there saying it's a necessity, but whether it is or not. Ski socks certainly are a necessity because you can't just ski in normal socks. You need to, to buy either the tube socks or the ski fitted socks. Um, and I've brought some examples up at the front as well. Ski goggles, yeah, they're just better than sunglasses. Um, because if you have ever worn sunglasses and tried to put like a neck warmer up and then you're breathing and then the breath goes into your glasses and your glasses steam up. Goggles generally don't steam up. Um, lip seal um, to stop lips getting chapped, sun cream, and then everything else on that list is kind of like extra layers. So things like a fleece jacket or a top, you know, you don't need to go and buy a fleece jacket. Quite often, students will wear the hoodie top that you're going to get as a layer to go underneath. So you might wear a t-shirt, your hoodie top, and a ski jacket. That would probably be suffice. You don't need to go and buy like a micro uh, fleece. I always carry spare stuff. So if somebody did arrive on the, on the day of departure and you know, they kind of forbid, they'd forgotten to bring all of their ski, ski clothing, which, you know, sure won't happen but I will have several changes of ski clothing so if you know an emergency I am able to kit students out um, and obviously that's kind of important I also and an email out to you as well I do have quite a lot of gloves and I do have quite a lot of goggles that I've collected over the years um, and if anybody wanted you know to save some money uh, money was an issue and you wanted to borrow any then as long as I've got some kit, I'm happy to, to lend them out to, to people too. So into ski is, is kind of like the, the option for the ski clothing because you've so you got children that are growing and to so actually go out and spend you know, 100, 150, 200 pounds on a set of ski clothing that you know is going to be used for one season, for one holiday, it's quite a big expense. So the reason we use into ski is that you can hide the clothing. Um, it's all generic black kit. Um, it's quite nice in a way that you know got quite a number of students they all look, look the same and it, it's good quality stuff um, in terms of like uh, how do you order it well it's all in the booklet there's a kind of like a detailed instructions on how to, to go but the most important thing is that when you get to the order page um, you select the departure date which is the 22nd of March 2024 type in my name Uthman it then says what tour operator you're going with. We're not going with Interski, we're going with IPT, so you just collect other, and then you'll see our trip. Click on that, and then once you place your order, Interski then package everything up and then send it through to Millthorpe School in like big plastic bags. I then tell the students that it's arrived in school, and they'll come and collect it, and then you wear it. And then afterwards, you don't have to launder it at all. You literally just bring it back in the same bags that it came in, and then it all just gets sent back to Interski. It's a very, very easy system, and it does save you money. I also talked about the fact that you, know, you can you can get some brilliant deals. I mean, I've just kitted out my children on Facebook Marketplace with ski clothing. It's, it's the kind of thing that as young people, you know, young people do grow, and you, you get your children kitted out, and then it doesn't fit them, and then it's only been used for a season. So there's always loads of deals on Facebook Marketplace um, if you wanted to, to invest in some, some of your own ski clothing at a slightly cheaper or reduced rate. Um, right, ski trip hoodies. So thank you, boys and girls, for coming to see Mr. Sloan. 
um, for your sizes. Um, so uh, I've got all of those in and I was able to put the order in. So everybody gets a ski trip hoodie. Um, and this is our design this year. We've gone for black. This is the green version. This is the 2022 version. Uh, we went blue last year. We've gone black this year. But black this year. That was the choice. Um, and yeah, somebody said, do we have to wear them? Well, <laughs> you, you can wear them at your leisure. You can choose to turn up on that uh, first Friday morning and wear them, or you can not. And you don't have to wear them. They're yours. Um, we don't. There's no. There's no kind of um, rule says that you have to wear them so that we can identify you. Um, but they're obviously a keepsake. I love the green one because um, I wear this all the time. Because it's my favourite. I'm not the fan of the blue one, but I like the green one. Um, um, so just talk a little bit about meds. Um, many students will require to bring with them medication, inhalers, epipens, etc. Um, we will check that students have what they need prior to departure. So you've already provided me with the medical information on the medical and dietary sheet that I, I sent out uh, originally. So I've collated all that information and that's shared out amongst the members of staff who need to know. Um, we then, when you arrive on that 22nd, make sure that students have got the medication that they need. And then all meds, part of the risk assessment, will be handed through to the members of staff. And we will, we will hold on to that. Of course, there are parts of the meds that the students will need to have with them themselves, things like inhalers or epipens, so we won't be collecting those in. But things like paracetamol, we'll take paracetamol, I think you've signed on the, the medical consent form whether we, you're happy for us to administer paracetamol. Sometimes people get dehydrated in ski resorts, so that's something we might, we might administer ourselves and carry that. But you might want to send children with those kind of meds. And all you would do is put it in a bag with the student's name on. And any additional information that is going to help me and the members of staff to, to help to keep your, your children safe and, uh, and medicated, then obviously you can pass that information. And if it's a, like a complex situation that you think requires a conversation, just pop me an email um, with the details or ask me to give you a call and then I'll have that chat because you won't be there to, to help out with the meds, but we will. And if we need to be in the know of something, of course, we'll, we'll do that. Um, so that's the meds. Uh, money. Um, it's, it's an expensive trip, isn't it, a ski trip? Um, but you'd be pleased to know that the vast majority of the money that you've invested in the trip is, you know, is going to cover most things. There's, there's no need to be taking huge amounts of spending money on the ski trip. Um, I was able to increase the amount of money that you, the children are getting at lunchtime to kind of like correspond to the rising prices in like mountain restaurants because of course, you know, you skiing in the mountains and you, you see a really nice restaurant and you ski in there, you know, you know they, they recognise that, that there's an opportunity to make some money off the bricks abroad and, and, and it's not cheap. So we used to do a 10 euro voucher for lunchtime, we've increased that to 15 euros per, per, per meal and that gets the students quite, you know, a substantial meal. So all we ask is that any money that's brought is, is just put in an envelope and then what we do is we look after the money. We, we don't want students to carry large amounts of money around and then leaving a wallet, um, <coughs> leaving a bag and then and losing it. So we, we tend to like help them to, to manage that money. Um, we collect it in on the bus and then because we've got 10 members of staff and there's 72 students, we'll have seven, seven or eight in a banking group. And then we'll go up and down the coach in the morning, say, does anybody need any money? And then we'll hand the money out to the students so that they've always got a little bit of money if they wanted to supplement the spending that they have in the man restaurants. So they might, you know, have a pizza and some chips and uh, a vasa, which is um, water in, in German. So, uh, and then they have a pink vasa. I can't remember what it's called. She vasa. Is it she vasa? Is that right, Miss Gordon? You might not know. <laughs> French, sorry. <laughs> um, but that's the that's the drink that, that most people have. It's like a it's like a fruit water. Um, but you you might decide that actually you're going to have apple strudel and custard. Oh yeah, it's good. 
Or you might go down to the uh, donut house, and there's a donut shop on the resort, and uh, people go down like chocolate donuts. Or you might want a pancake, or you might have one of, one of those huge ice creams. And if that's the case, then obviously you can supplement whatever you spend in your lunch money with the money that you take on board. In terms of in terms of accessing shops and things, there's, there's not really many shops to access. Our hotel is slightly separated away from the local town. We don't really have time to, to go on shopping excursions. We do tend to call back one day and we take the students for an ice cream um, in a place called Bishop Hoffman uh, and there's an opportunity to buy some souvenirs um, there but that's kind of like a one trip. We've got the evening ends which are all paid for. The only money that you would need is to supplement like a, a drink or a couple of drinks there. So yeah, you don't need to to take loads and loads and loads of euros. We, we ask the students to take some English currency because on the journey there and the journey back we might be stopping at service stations and uh, well, we will be stopping at service stations and you'll be able to you know, spend some money. I think because we're travelling with DFDS and not uh, P&O ferries, I'm fairly sure and it was last year, because we had two coaches last year, one went on P&L and one went on DFDS. And the P&L ferry, they didn't get any food, yeah. whereas we went on the DFDS, we actually got a £10 food voucher, yeah. Mr Sloan's nodding. And we are booked on DFDS, so I think we get a free meal on the ferry. I'll double check that and email that, but that would be a great, great saving of money too. <coughs> um, I use a prepaid credit card, so I've just... It's just like a bank card, um, and I just put some English currency onto that, and it converts into euros, and I just use it like a chip and pin. Um, it's called Travelex, and you can apply for it. It's a very quick and simple, easy thing to do. And you can just top it up from home. If you didn't want your children to come with like loads of cash, the Travelex card, it works at the same exchange rate as you would do if you were to exchange it over at, at uh, Tesco's or or wherever you wanted to change them, it's called the Travel X card, it works quite well. Um, so we are this year travelling with a new company, I've never travelled with this company before, uh, they're called Circle, is it Circle, Circle Mine? It's a Circle, um, uh, I googled them, they're uh, an Edinburgh company, they've got a huge fleet of coaches, um, and they will be sending two 53-seater coaches to Millthorpe to accommodate us. So in total there's 80, 82 passengers, we've got capacity for 106. So there's a little bit of space in the coach, which is nice to know. They are luxury coaches, they need to be luxury because you spend a lot of time on them. Um, we don't swap coaches, so there will be some you know, seating arrangements to organise and once those have all been organised, we don't swap and change between coaches obviously for, for head counting reasons. Um, and then this is the arrangement. So uh, this is the first time I've managed to share this. I've only just kind of got this information from the ski company. Uh, and I'm pleased about this because quite often they aren't able to tell me the exact timings. What happens is the ferry companies withhold all of their, their, tra uh, their crossing times for coaching. If you can imagine that there's lots and lots of coaches going over to Europe at, at Easter. They don't actually give out the times until about two weeks before. So the fact that I've got the time is great. So, the arrangements are, on Friday the 22nd, we are, obviously as the school is still running, so, you know, the rest of the school population is still in school, and you, of course, are coming on the ski trip, so there's no expectation, and I wouldn't want anybody to be going into school to do lessons on Friday morning. You are at home getting ready to come, come to, to get dropped off for the ski trip. So, um, we are aiming to leave here at quarter past 12. But as you can imagine, trying to get 72 children into school and getting everything sorted and organised and getting them onto the coach takes a little bit of time. And also, if we all had like a small window of dropping off time, it means that everybody's trying to drop off in a school that's functioning. So what I've asked is if we could drop <coughs> off at school somewhere between 10.45 and 11.30. So there's a 45-minute window there. So, you know... Some people will be early, some people will be late, it's absolutely fine. It will just, we'll just manage it and then what will happen is the Millport staff who are on the trip will be at the back gates, the Philadelphia Terrace Gate, and we'll, we'll be able to you know, 
you know, you'd be able to quickly drive in and, and then drop the children off. We'll usher them into, into here. And then, fortunately, you just have to go. You can't hang around and wait around. There won't be the capacity to do that. The car park will be full, full of staff cars. Um, the coaches will be coming into this area here and parking up too. So it's going to be a drop and run of the Then that 45 minute window allows us to get everybody in here, making sure everything's correct. And the coaches are arriving around uh, 11.45. We then start getting the students onto the coach with an intention to leave here at, at quarter past 12. Um, and we're just, you know, be collecting medicine, you know, parents might just have a last little bit of information. We also have a toilet stop, um, and make sure that we, we're we ready to, to travel. We then travel down to Dover, and uh, approximately 7.30 get down to Dover. Um, and then I've got the boat references on there, you can keep track of those if you wanted to. Um, ferry departs 9.30, and then with uh, Europe being an hour ahead of us, I think it's, I think it's like... Half past nine, half past ten, half by two and a half hours. We're about midnight, one o'clock when we get to France. That's very late, isn't it? So the children are going to be tired. I mean, we don't stay on the coach. If anybody's been on a ferry, you have to get off the coach. You have to go onto onto the upper upper deck area. We don't allow people to go outside. We stay within inside of the the boat. You don't go out onto the outer decks because for health and safety reasons. We then get settled into the coach and then we travel through the night get as much sleep as we possibly can to arrive approximately at two o'clock at the hotel and then on the way back all the details are there we you know we've had a great trip and then we ski all the way up to thursday afternoon we come back to the hotel to shower get changed and then we get back on the coach on the thursday at seven o'clock at the evening and then we travel back to the uk and then, of course, we can't be absolutely 100% certain that it will be half past seven. Coach drivers definitely always want to get back early because <laughs> they want to finish their week's work as early as possible. So, you know, I say half past seven, but there's been times when we've, we've caught the ferry at like six o'clock and then we've been back in the UK at seven o'clock and we've been back in York for like two o'clock. It will very much be that kind of like, you know, possibility that there might be a five hour window, six hour, and of course you will have seen last year the horrendous journey that we had on the way there with was it, was it three days it took us to get to Austria. Three days. Um, we might have some travel, travel disruptions. So what happens is as soon as we get to the UK, children are absolutely fine to be messaging home if for any reason there's no credit on phones, then we, you know, we, we have an emergency phone and we make sure that we keep you fully aware of what's going on with our travel arrangements. Um, in terms of rules for a relaxing journey, well, I'm not going to read through this. You can read through these with your children. It's just about being courteous and well-mannered and polite and sensible and <coughs> considerate of each other and considerate of you know, your teachers. You know, we just need to be nice human beings with each other that are sharing, you know, a very, very small space for 26 hours. It's just about rubbish and keeping your space nice and clean and not being silly with food and be careful. We don't know what um, the bus drivers will tell us. We don't know. We've never met them. So sometimes we get really, we like young people drivers. And sometimes we get drivers who really don't like young people. <laughs> But we don't, we don't get choice in that. And what we do is we use all of our personalities to try and make sure that we have a good relationship with our drivers so that they are more inclined to allow us to eat and drink on the coaches and things. So we do our very best to make sure that that's the case. Um, the rules and the expectations, um, I say the rules are the, the most important things. They are the most, the expectations is please just be mindful. Uh, comfort on the coach. So, uh, take some food for the journey, <clears throat> don't just take sweets and drinks, you need some, something that's got a little bit more nutritional value than, than just crisps and chocolate bars and sweets because yeah, you're not going to have much, much time to run off that sugar when you're on a coach, so, so really some, some carbohydrates, some, some slow releasing carbohydrates 
um, some nice food, um, please don't just bring sweets and drinks, but of course, there will be opportunities to buy things as we stop. Um, nut allergies, we do have some students with nut allergies, so can I ask please that, that food containing nuts isn't part of the, the food that's brought on to the, the coach, I'll put a reminder out for that, but we have a, I think we're a nut free school, are we nut free school? I think we're still a nut free school, Mr. Smith's Richards is not in. So it's the same on the coach. Um, entertainment, it's a, I don't know, do, do you have DVDs? <laughs> I've still got a few, but you might not have any. Um, so, so it's fine for you to bring DVDs. Um, I will bring my selection, um, but you might not want to watch what I watch. So, so there's usually, I think Mr. Sloan's uh, a Harry Potter fan, I so, so, so you'll bring up pretty much all the Harry Potters. Um, Star Wars, you know, that's something that I can bring. But you might have a video, a, a deep video, you can do that. Video. Very bad. Um, yeah, you, uh, yeah, you DVD, so you might have a favourite film that you want to bring along. Get to a charity shop, there's loads of DVDs in charity shops, you might see your favourite film. I think, right, we could watch that on a ski trip, but it is a young trip, um, so I think it's year eight and year nine, so it has to be age appropriate. Um, sleeping on the coach, so a neck pillow, a oh, oh. This isn't my neck pillow, this is one that was left from last year's. <laughs> um, a neck pillow is, is always a good, you know, people bring their own pillows. Um, blankets, um, yeah, absolutely, all of those things are for comfort. We don't want it to be uncomfortable, so it's all right to bring those things that make you comfortable. Um, I've just said travelling on the ferry, so we leave the students on. It's a bit stressful as the ferry because you've got, you've got loads of other coaches with loads of other school children who are all wearing hoodies. And they all look, you know, it, it's really, really stressful. Because, <laughs> yeah, we can't describe it, kind of it's stress, it's a stress. Um, as you come up the stairs, everyone just makes a beeline for, the, for an area where they can have an area which is really safe that you know the students can, can like locate to. And as a member of staff, you walk up and then and you get to and it's all busy and then you have to go there. So, so it's really important that, that we are slick getting off the coach. So we take the children up in, in our banking groups and we walk them to a particular area. And then that's the designated area where the members of staff always sat. And then when the students are allowed to go off in groups of three or more, then at a certain point then they come back and then we meet them and take them back down to the, to the, uh, to the coaches. <laughs> in that time they're allowed to go and get some food, go around the duty free, etc, go to the toilet. Uh, but it, it is carnage. I would, I would highly recommend <laughs> never ever travelling on a ferry over the Easter off every half term <laughs> on a Friday or Saturday night. Um, there's no, there's no access to the outside, so that's an absolute no-no. We know that they're inside the boat itself. We know that you know, there's nothing serious going to happen. Um, the, the students, are sh we share the, the emergency phone number with the students. So on the trip, they've always got you know, the, the option of phoning the emergency number. So they're always in mobile phone contact. They've always got that number in their phones. Um, so that's another a layer of, of um, health and safety with respect to the to the to the ferry. Um, so we are staying in the Werfenhof Hotel in Austria. We've stayed in the Werfenhof for the last two years. It's awesome. It's a brilliant hotel. Um, the ladies who run the hotel are just so accommodating. Uh, and they actually asked for North Hospital to come back and stay there and we've got a really nice relationship with them. The food is awesome, um, the, the rooms are great, it's just a really, really brilliant hotel to take this number of students to. We have sole occupancy, so, so the only people in the hotel are us. Um, occasionally, um, the, we've got a bar and there'll be some locals who will come in. They, last year they did some kind of egg cracking thing, didn't they? <laughs> understand what they were doing, is it? <laughs> it was just a traditional thing that they do in Austria at Easter where they, they bring hard boiled eggs in and then they crack them on each other's heads and things. <laughs> <laughs> that was 
that was interesting. <laughs> We've had the yodelers in the hotel before as well, the yodelers. Um, so, in terms of in terms of its function, so. Um, it functions as a, it says it functions as a normal hotel. I say I'm telling you that we've got so lot to put in, um, but they will have people coming in, so we have to, to be considerate of that. Um, the rules for accommodation again, I'd like you to go through those rules with the children. Just to talk through these are all of the all of the things that you would expect a member of staff and a group of teachers to expect of the students that they're managing. You know, things like no boys and girls room, no girls in boys rooms, no jumping on the beds, um, certainly not leaving the hotel at all, unless they're with a member of staff, um, being quiet when they need to be quiet, quiet down when they need to be quiet, keeping the rooms tidy, not just like chucking all wet clothes or dirty clothes just on the floor and leaving them there. There will be an element of checking rooms by the staff, but really don't want to be going into a room that's been shared by four or five boys or four or five girls to, to start having to help out to tidy underwear and things like that. So just making sure that those things are, are done. Being on time, that's one of the biggest things in a hotel. You know, there's going to be times when we ask people to get to places. Um, so in terms of um, rooms, so I haven't done the rooms yet um, because I've still got to get confirmation of exactly the number of rooms that we've got. But the hotel is a certain size and I know that it roughly sleeps about 85, 86 guests. I mean, so, and we've got 82 of us that are, are staying in the hotel. So this slight room for manoeuvre but it, it has the rooms that they are there so they're all, they're all set in stone. Um, some rooms have got two, some four, some sixes, some sevens. And then we just have to, like a jigsaw, just have to fit the students into those rooms. We always, always want to put the students into the rooms with their friends. That's absolutely important to you and to them and to us, because why would we want to not put them in with the rooms? There may be times when we, we ask the students to be a little bit more accommodating, so you might have a group of six who desperately want to go, I might say, well, I can't put you in a six, and you have to split into two threes. That's just because we are defined by the, the room sizes. Um, and there's always you know, room for negotiation and we'll, we'll do our best to fit everybody in. The staff just get them what, whatever's left. You know? So we, we, we are the last people to get roomed in the hotel you know, because it's important for the students. When I have that meeting, boys and girls, it's really important you come to it. Because if you don't come to it, you might get left out. And if you get left out, then it means that you might not end up in a room where you want to be. So it's important you come to that meeting, it will be advertised on bulletin. Um, we expect students to be contacting home. Um, that also brings about stress. It brings about a stress because sometimes when things aren't great, the first port of call is mum, dad, or the, somebody at home that is going to be able to be that shoulder where somebody's going to express their unhappiness or, or problems or concerns. And whilst, whilst we understand why that would be the case, it's sometimes not helpful for us because you know, we are looking after, after the children. Before mobile phones, that was never an issue. You know, it wasn't a problem, so they, they had to come to us if they had a problem. But it's easy for them to then go to you if there's a problem. Well, actually, that stresses you out because you're so, so detached from your children in a different country. There's not a lot you can do other than give them advice. Um, we want to know if it's something that we need to know about, then, then you then have to either try and contact me. But you, you know that the emergency contact number is really for emergencies, so you don't really want to use it. So it just puts us all in a situation. So we, so we just say to, to you as parents, start the conversation, you know, if there's something, a matter, a problem or a concern, please ask your children to come speak to us. Because we're there and we are the best people to be able to manage that situation. Now, if something's been horrible to your, to your child, they just need to be able to come and tell us somebody's been unkind, or they're feeling homesick, or, you know, anything, any of the issues whatsoever, um, they just need to come to us and then we'll be able to manage. And if it means that, you know, we're in the loop, there's no reason, you know, the conversation that you have with them, 
but it's just about being mindful of the fact that we will be doing everything we possibly can to make this a wonderful experience for everybody. But we do recognise that sometimes things aren't quite as they would seem. So just by being transparent and communicating with us, that really helps. Um, in terms of you contacting your children, you know, you, you might have radio silence. And, you know, children, I think, don't phone the parents often. And you want to know what's happening. And you want to know what's going on. And, and you might have radio silence if you haven't been contacted for a couple of days. And that can be stressful for you as parents because, actually, you know, you want to know they're having a good time. Well, I suppose no news is good news, and silence means that they're, you know, they're having too much of a good time to have, want to bother the parents because they don't need to touch because they're just having a great time. I will phone you, or somebody will phone you if there's a problem in resort. We will encourage the students to phone you and to, to drop your message, you know, because I'm sure that your pockets are the ones that have been, uh, you know, delved into to pay for the trip. So, that, you know, there has to be that an appreciation from your parents who have provided you this opportunity. Make sure that you, you keep in contact with them. But of course, you know, that can only come from me. So, so just be mindful of that. I think the best thing to do is, is if you are concerned that, you know, there hasn't been contact and, and you want your children to contact, rather than use the emergency phone, just drop me an email, because I have my emails on the phone anyway, so it just pings into my inbox and then it'd be, excuse me, so I've not heard from such and such, is everything all right? And if everything's fine, I'll say, yeah, everything's fine, and then it gives me a, I'll just pop another word with that student. Do you know that your mum was just wondering how you're getting on if you contacted your mum? No, um, I haven't, I've not thought about the mum, that's all <laughs> And, and we can just have that little conversation with them to say, just check in at home because somebody wants to know that everything's all right. Yeah. Um, so we run a tuck shop. Um, I go up to the cash and carry and I buy chocolate and crisps and, and drinks. I'm saying don't bring those things out. But actually, when we're in when we're in the hotel, there's not there isn't a shop we can go to. So we we do buy lots of chocolate and crisps and things so that they've got some snacks and things um, for when we're there and um, we just sell it at cost price it's not there to make any money it's just there so that they can have some chocolate crisps and sweets we run it as a, like a you come to the shop you, you, you tell us what you want and we tally it all and at the end we just add it up and then you just pay your bill at the end so there's no change in the money um, and that's how we run the tuck shop you know Boys and girls, if you see me around school and you just a, a particular thing that you say, oh, could you get that from? Or like this or like that. If I know what you want, then I can get those things into the tuck shop. Yeah. Um, mobile phones, we just have a similar rule in that, you know, you, the students are allowed to use their mobile phones when they're in the leisure time and in the hotel. And we expect them to do that. It's, uh, it's their thing. And it's, it's everybody's thing now. So there's no... You know, there's no ban on phones. One boy last year, first thing he did, he got on the lift. He went up the lift and he was so excited he went to take a photograph of the phone straight off the lift, down into the snow underneath the lift. He lost his phone. So it's the kind of thing, well, yeah, you bring them, they're your responsibility. There's loads of photo opportunities to have, yeah. People want to share the experience, it's fine. There's just going to be times when we say no phones, so meal times, there's no phones. You're not going to be sat at a table with a phone table. Um, you're not going to be on your phone when you're in lesson, uh, when you're in ski school. Uh, you're not going to be on a phone when I'm talking or somebody's talking to... Uh, there was a phone when I was there. Uh, you're not going to be on the phone if I'm speaking to the coach, you know, uh, because I need to get a message across. And again, it just talks by the books. Um, right, this is where we're going. So the detail you can't see but Alpendorf and, and the small hill area is enormous so on the far right hand side just got a point. there that's Alpendorf so that's where we start and then if you were trying to ski as a good skier to get from there you go up here drop drop down to here go up to there go to there to there to there to there across down into this valley across the G-Link to there there, you wouldn't be 
be able to get back. You won't be able to get back in time. It's that far. So it's enormous. The area is enormous. Now, for those people who are, you know, skiers who've been to skiing and skiing and skiing resorts before, you know, you are going to go on a journey. I always say skiing's like a journey. When you're learning, you. Use the same slope over and over again because you're trying to find your ski legs. But actually, as you get good at skiing, you set off in the morning and you, you don't ski the same piece because you drop down into this valley, go up this lift, and you go on a journey somewhere. And then you look at the time and you go, Oh, we better go back. And then you turn around and come back. So there's, there's so much skiing. And because there's so much skiing, it means that, you know, there's loads of opportunity to, to kind of like do different kinds of runs and, and also it's able to accommodate huge numbers of people. I mean I was at New Year in the resort and it was the busiest it was been but you, you're only queuing for five minutes to go on a lift and you're going back up again. So and, and I know you might think that it's even busier at the February half term or Easter but it's not because the local people stay away because they know that the English are in the resort and they don't like them. So, so I experienced it at the new year and it felt busy but still not busy. And also as you, as you kind of get better at skiing it means that you get to go on the, the more advanced runs and, and the more advanced the run is the less people are on it because they might not have ski legs to get on it and, it, and it's a learning environment so there's lots of beginner skiers in resort staff so for those people who are able skiers you, you, you have a brilliant time and for those that are uh, just learning to ski, it's brilliant anyway because you learn to ski. And in terms of the statistics, um, I can't remember, but I think there's, is it 200, 240 kilometres of skiing? Yeah. And there's one run, and it's my favourite run, and you, you ski from the top to the bottom and absolutely just not really turning, just pointing your skis down the slope and just going for it from top to bottom. It's like 11 minutes of just down and, and it's just phenomenal. So that's, that's why we keep going back to the area. So in terms of what happens with ski, ski expectations, have I done ski fit? Yeah, ski fit. I'll do ski fit. So when we get there in resort, um, we We've got all your details of feet and, and heights and weights and things, so all of the skis are all prepared and waiting for us in resort. They have like a little card um, with the student's name on it, and it has the number of their skis and their number of their boots. Um, that goes into the ski pocket. Um, and then they're all, we try on before we ski um, to make sure everything fits. Now you might have thought, oh, it's a while since we measured the feet, and the feet you know, have changed size. We don't worry about that because we've got the rough ideas of the skis, uh, ski boots and then we have the ski fit. Um, they're not the easiest things to put on, in fact they're not very comfortable, in fact they're, they're a lot, you know, they're, they're pretty horrible to wear and you, you look forward to taking them off at the end of the day. But they need to be tight because you're attached to a plank of wood that you're going to ask to change from edge to edge to be able to hold your feet uh, to the edge of the slope. So they need to be stiff and, and tight and they're not that comfortable. Um, we help, and one of the biggest things that we do in the morning when we get the students to actual to the bottom of the slope is we're on our hands and knees helping students to get ski boots on, and at the end of the day getting them off. Um, we just need to take take into consideration that with 82 pairs of boots that get put down, and then remembering who's the whose boots, and not just going to grab the nearest boots because you think that they're your boots, because they look like your boots, but you haven't checked the number, and then putting them on, and then trying to clip them to your skis, but they're not fit your skis, because they're not being sell for your skis, and then somebody else has got your boots, and you've got theirs, so just be mindful of that. Um, getting ready for skiing, it's important to highlight that just actually getting to the ski lessons in the morning is quite, quite an adventure. It's an organisational uh, disaster sometimes um, with so many things to do because you know, you've got to get 82 people out of the hotel with gloves and goggles and you've got to hand out the lunch passes and, um, you know, and making sure everybody's got something, everything that they need. So getting that ball rolling is quite hard. So, we're going to be shepherding to get students ready, but they need to be resilient. 
there may be some sharp sharpness from the staff as we're tired. Come on, what are you doing? Get your things. You know, you just got to be resilient to that and be be ready for that kind of getting ready in the morning. Ultra organised, punctual, resilience, and also helpful of each other. So a typical ski day um, starts around 7:15. So we do breakfast in hotel. Students come down dressed and ready to be to be skiing. Um, we then have an hour to get ourselves out of the hotel. We we drive to the slope. Um, that gives us an opportunity to to get our heads into gear in terms of what we're, we're going to do. Um, hand anything else out that we need to do in terms of lunch passes. Then we get all of our skis and boots, and then we head up the, the mountain. Um, and there's a six-person chair lift. Which takes us up to a place called uh, a Chrysanharm, which is which is where the learner area is. Once we get the mountain, then the, the IBT instructors will then take charge. So we, as Milthorpe staff, get students to the mountain, and then the IBT staff staff take charge of the students. We'll have talk, I'll talk through about ski school in a second. They then go and have their ski lesson in the morning for two and a half hours. And if they are a mobile group, in that two and a half hours they will be moving away from the resort probably. They then stop with their instructor to have an hour's worth of lunch, up to an hour, depending on how enthusiastic they are. They might do an hour, they might do four or five minutes. And that's usually in the mountain restaurant. And then they're back into uh, lessons in the afternoon for another two and a half hours. That means that we're rough, you know, three, three forty-five, stroke four o'clock, we'll finish off our ski lesson. They're very generous with the ski lessons. You know, if there's a group that do well, they're not like, oh, we need to get back at 3.45. They will ski them, and you know, they're not stingy with the, with the, the lessons at all. We then go back to the hotel. It's an action-packed day. We do that for five days. So it's tiring. It is hard work, but it is definitely worth it. Um, it cooperation and resilience, as I said. When we get into ski lessons, the protocol and rules are really to do with the fact that you're in a lesson, so you, you respect the teachers that are teaching you. Um, in terms of your experience, you, you've shared your experience with me on, on the sheet. That might have changed. You might have been to escape, and, or you might have been lucky enough to go skiing at Christmas or at, Eve, uh, at, um, at New Year. You might be going skiing in February. If any changes have occurred in terms of skiing ability, email me and I can update the sheet. Because what we do is we want to put the students into the correct ability. It's no point in being in a, a group where you, you're far too good or you're not good enough because the experience that you get won't be as positive as it wants. We, we generally, you know, I will look at the list and then I will look at friendship groups and then I'll look at the students. Clearly, if we've got lots of beginners, it's easy to put them into friendship groups. As soon as we start to get more able, um, you know, you might be you know, five five holidays of skiing and a year eight student, and there's no other year eight student. That. So, so you might not necessarily ski with with the people who you want to, unless you had a conversation with me. Said it's really important. I don't care that I'm in a lesser group. I just want to be with my friends, and that would be a conversation you need to have with me. But I'll put you into your groups, and then after day one, the instructors will have looked at you and checked out your ability. So the person who's been uh, you know, confident, I am definitely a brilliant skier. I'm going to put down a bit for two weeks, but you're not a skier. Um, and and you, you exaggerated a little bit, I'll say. You might not be in the right ski. So there might be movement down, but there also might be movement up. And, and we just have to get it as fluid as possible. It's, it's for safety reasons, really. Um, and also for the experience. So, it's about turning up and being the best that you can be. Always listen to instructors. And if you listen to instructors and try and follow their instruction, you will progress quicker. Um, they're not fixed, as I said. Ski groups are definitely not fixed, uh, and we work what's best. What tends to happen is at the start of the week, the, the instruction goes to the beginners. So, so we have a certain number of instructors, and they, you know, they, they give the instructions to the, the students who are less able to get them up to speed so that they can get from the, the beginner slopes to go and do the more intermediate and advanced. So sometimes our beginner groups are, you know, are slightly smaller so that they can progress a bit quicker. Um, just about 
be less than expectations. Again, if I could ask you to go through that with your children, just about what we do expect. It's just the, the thing that I need to get across is that you are not to do your own thing. You don't think, well, I'm not listening to you. I'm going to go off and ski myself. That's an absolute no-no. And if that was the case, then we wouldn't take the mountain again. Um, it's just about following instructions, but I'll leave them for you to talk through. Because um, there's two pages and I don't need to read them out to you. And accidents occur, fortunately, because it is a, a dangerous sport where children are, you know, sometimes slightly out of the control of their centre of mass and hurtling towards the bottom of the slope and needs to fall over because they are, you know, going going to crash if they don't fall over. And things do happen, twisted ankles, um, twisted um, sprained wrists are common. Um, we have collisions occasionally, um, you know, where students can't stop and they climb into another student. Um, and, you know, whilst I can't, all of the ski instructors know the abilities of the students, so they, they are mindful of, of what the students can do, but occasionally accidents happen. Um, and there has been times in other ski trips, and I have spent time in hospitals, and I have had to have you know, conversations with parents, tell, you, tell them that actually there's been a serious accident and we've got broken bones. Um, and say, it is a possibility, but you just got to understand that that's what we signed up to, to do a kind of an, an adventurous activity that, that, you know, they're going on. And as, as you would, if you were taking them, you know, you can try and be as safe as possible, but accidents do happen. So in those scenarios, we, we obviously take on that local apprentice situation and we go to hospital with the children. Um, if anybody's ill, we manage the situation there. Um, we, we've got the, the doctor that we can call upon. We've got the pharmacist just around the corner. So we just act like you would act if your children are injured or, or ill. Um, and of course, we keep you informed of those, those things and situations because obviously you would want to know about those things. Um, that's why the G-Hit card is so important because if we have to go to hospital and it does require some medical attention, there is a bill to pay and they don't allow the students out of the, out of the hospital. If they haven't got a G-Hit card, it's billed and you have to pay it there and then. The G-Hit card is so that you don't have to then go and claim things off insurance. So, for example, if a student was to, to hurt themselves and had to have an x-ray, that would cost X amount of money to be released from the hospital. If you didn't have a GE card, you would have to pay that money. You present the GE card, you don't have to pay it, then you just leave the hospital. And I was caught out a couple of years ago with a student who didn't have a GE card and, and it, was, it wasn't easy. So it is a definite necessity that the GE card is taken. And then the students carry their own GE card on the slope. Now, I might be skiing in a part of the resort, and the, the accident might be in another part of the resort. They're not going to wait for me to ski back to take the student to hospital. The student would go to hospital, probably with one of the IBT staff, and then it might be that I have to then get to the hospital. I might be a couple of hours later. But they would be taken care of because they're obviously their primary. You know, response to them is their health and well-being. So if they need to go to hospital, they go to hospital, even if I'm not there. And then a Millthorpe member of staff would get there as soon as possibly could. So that would be the protocol. Um, so, that's accidents. Um, excursions. We are going to a place called Aquasatsum. It's great. It's, um, it's got an outside swimming pool. It's got heated pool outside so it's really nice at evening time to go out and swim underneath the stars if there's a bit of snow around so it's great. It's got slides, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a quite an upmarket uh, leisure centre. It's the kind of place I'd like to go myself and my wife and just have a relaxing time. And you can imagine the people who have chosen to do that. <laughs> never see a coach right? the car. <laughs> So there's, there's certain parts of the Aquasalsa area that you're not allowed to go in the leisure area. Um, and of course, because it's Europe and, and saunas are slightly different in Europe than they are in the UK. I don't think you'd want to go into sauna. 
in, uh, in Europe. Um, so, and it's, it's posh, it's, it's, it's a really ultra modern kind of system. You know, it's really nice. Um, so, we go there for an evening uh, and there's water slides. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a pool that is like connected to the pool, and we sometimes get the students to run around it to make like a world pool. That's always a good thing to do. Um, we all go in, we all go down. It's, it's not a deep swimming pool. Um, I've asked about your, your children's swimming ability because a real concern about swimming, it would come in an email to let me know. But we all go in and we all have a nice time. It's quite nice to do on an evening after skiing. Um, and say it's not a deep pool, so it's a safe pool. And there's a lifeguard on as well, so that's, that's good. And then we also get to take the students bowling, which is a, a, an excursion to the city of Salzburg. And it's, um, Sportfeld Armadi, which is after Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who was born from Salzburg. So we go to Salzburg and we go bowling for a couple of hours. Um, we also do the IVT quiz, which is legendary. Um, we also do a presentation evening when the instructors come in and, and present. We, we get these excursions as part of the package, but of course, um, we can't have an excursion every night because that just increases the cost. And also, it's quite nice to have a little bit of downtime as well. Because if you're doing something every night, the children get exhausted. Um, I've just said in the evenings and our excursions, there has to be downtime. And then, of course, bedtimes and things, we just need to ensure that there's children are getting plenty of sleep. Because the, the worst thing that you can be when you're on a, on a ski holiday is tired. And of course, the very nature of skiing is tiring. So we're going to be quite strict about getting to sleep and you know, encouraging students to go to sleep. The first night is always difficult because it's that new thing. The second night we're generally pretty good. Um, we just have to get some sleep because we're there to, to ski as our primary, primary uh, reason for being there. And it's vital, um, cooperative and just ensuring that you know, you're not keeping somebody else awake. That's one of the things that children phone home about. I can't get to sleep. I'm struggling to get to sleep in a room with three of my other friends who want to talk. That's, that's often a phone call that happens. And of course, if that comes in your direction at like 11 o'clock at night, you know, one, you don't welcome that, and, and there's not a lot you can do about it, is there? And you certainly wouldn't want to be phoning me at 11 o'clock. I'll want to be sleeping too. So, so that's just something to consider. Um, I share the emergency contact number. So it's in this booklet. Um, this is for you. It's got all of the information hopefully that you need for the ski trip. Um, of course, it's not to be shared around. It's for you to, to, to phone or use in the case of an emergency. Um, and I just ask you to use it in the case of an emergency. Um, Email, as I said, is a better way to contact me if it's non-emergency, that you just need to get a message through to me. And I think if you've emailed me, hopefully I've emailed you back pretty quick. Um, I've not left you, left you, you know, waiting for a response. I'm pretty good at, at replying um, with messages. Um, just use it as an emergency. I've got your numbers, uh, and you shared two numbers. And I've got all of them on, on all of my sheets and I've collated them so I can always get in contact with you if I need to. Um, our passports and GD cards, thanks very much for bringing them along. You know, I, I said to bring them, but it might be that you're going away before, you might be going away for every half term. I just ask that you could hand those in three weeks before we, we depart, and that gives me any kind of last minute kind of. Ooh, it's out of date, or oh, you haven't got a GE card yet. Just gives me that opportunity to help you to get those things in place because you haven't got a GE, or you haven't got a passport, and I can't take you to Austria. So, three weeks prior to travel. Um, in terms of how I communicate, um, it's always via email. That's the easiest thing to do for me. It's just about keeping your eye. Last year, we, we were due to set off at a certain time, and then in the very last minute, ski company came back to me and said, I'm sorry, we're now setting up a different time. That would be a, you know, a message I'd have to get out to you. Um, just keep an eye on your, on your emails. And then, of course, keep me in the loop if anything's happening at your end in terms of skiing ability, um, medical changes, dietary changes, anything that you think I might need to know. 
um, that you want me to obviously have, have considerations for, and then I can obviously respond to that. Um, I've put some websites onto the booklet at the back, which you might want to look at, skiamardi.com and IBT Ski. They've got a little bit more detail, and then there's a few video links at the back. What I've done is I've put all of the, all of the inter-ski stuff at the front. So from left to right, it goes XSS, X small, small, medium. I've also got, say, some ski kit at the front. Things like micro fleeces and things. Um, if you want to come and have a look at that and have a conversation with any of the people who are going on a trip in the room, please come and do that. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you very much for coming. I hope it's been informative. And you know, we are super excited about taking the children's skiing. It's not long to go now. Um, but yeah, thank you very much.